Jason Harlow was sitting outside his wife's office at 7 o'clock p.m. because he was finally going to end the sham of a marriage he and his wife had been pretending to have. Some husbands missed the signs, long hours when she never worked them before, dressing better, more frequent girls' nights out, and a noticeable decrease in intimacy at home. But not Jason. He noticed everything and was done with it. He estimated that it had been going on for four months. It was then that he noticed his wife, Caroline, wore a pair of red high heels to work for the first time. She hated wearing heels. The only time she would tolerate them was for the occasional wedding or other special occasions, and when she dressed up in the bedroom. She would wear the red heels with black stockings, paired with a lacy bra and thong set on certain occasions. Jason loved those black thigh-high stockings and loved seeing her in heels. He thought they had a good love life, but she never wore high heels to work. When he asked her about it, what's with the heels, babe? Something special today. She paused for a moment, then continued without turning around and said, I have a presentation with my boss today. Just want to look sharp. He didn't respond but thought, looking sharp for who? Your boss and let it go. Then the late hours started. At first it was just an hour or so, but later it became two to three hours several nights a week. When the girls' nights out started, he knew what was really going on. She hated clubs, lounges, and bars. Her idea of going out was a nice dinner or coffee. She didn't drink and looked down on those who did. He followed her on the third girls' night out, and she went to a house in Silverwood. He recognized the house. He'd been there a few times for office parties. It was her boss, Richard Green's house. Jason waited for over an hour, and when he was confident that she was planning to stay and not just making a stop on the way, he let the air out of all four of her tires and drove home. She didn't mention the tires when she got home that night or over the weekend, but he heard her tell their daughter, Would you believe someone let the air out of my tires last night? No way, really, she replied. Yep, thank God they didn't slash them. Just let the air out. I use that air pump your dad makes me keep in the truck. Wow, where'd you go? Just a dance club with some friends. You should probably avoid it in the future. Caroline smirked and said, Sure thing, baby. Jason met with an attorney and began the divorce proceedings. That was why he was sitting outside her office. She was going to be served that evening. He lamented over the fifteen years of marriage, but overall, they had been good years. They produced his fourteen-year-old daughter, Ava, who was the apple of his eye, and a daddy's girl. He met Caroline when he needed a lawyer for a contract issue with his former employer. Back then, she was a paralegal aspiring to be an attorney. He thought she was stunning and asked her out. They dated happily for two years before he proposed, and he thought they were happy throughout their marriage, right up until she started working for Richard Green. He worked as a sales manager and sometimes had long hours, but they spent as much time together as possible as a family. They went on weekend trips as Ava's schedule allowed. She always had one sport going on or some other activity keeping her busy. Occasionally, Jason and Caroline would go to the Hamptons or Cape Cod for a weekend without Ava when she was old enough to stay home. The shock of Caroline's betrayal cut him deeply. She had been increasingly distant with him, but he had never suspected she was cheating until he noticed the heels. It all went downhill from there. Her attitude got worse and progressively more hostile. He recalled the conversation on the night he followed her. Honey, why don't we go out to dinner and catch a movie tonight? I've got a rare Friday off and I want to spend some time with you, he said. You know I go out with the girls now on Fridays. They rely on me to be their designated driver. Let them Uber for one night. With the extra hours you've been working and these nights out, I hardly see you anymore. Well, if you had a real job, one that didn't have you working all hours of the evening and sometimes overnight, you might see me more. You don't though, and I've had to put up with it for almost fifteen years. Suck it up. I'll see you later. She didn't even say goodbye when she walked out the door. He was stunned. He followed her into the garage and watched her pull out. 
he grabbed his keys and hurried out after her. There was only one way out of their subdivision, and it was quite a maze of streets to get to the main road from their house. He caught up to her as she turned onto Oak Street and followed her to Richard's house. He avoided her for the rest of the weekend and resolved to find a lawyer on Monday. He didn't want to go scorch earth. He just wanted a fair split and an amicable end to the marriage. Through her words and actions, he felt she didn't want him anymore. So why hold on to a relationship that was clearly over? She could have her boss without a fight from him, he thought. He told his daughter about it that Monday. She's cheating on me, sweetheart. You may not have noticed a difference over the last few months, but I have. She's checked out of the marriage and is with her boss. No way, daddy. I don't believe it. I followed her to his house. She said she was going out with friends. She didn't. She went to his house. But her tires were messed with at the club. No, sweetie. I did it. And I did it at his house when I saw that she wasn't going to a club. I just can't believe it, Daddy. Me either. But it's true. His daughter was sitting next to him, waiting for the inevitable confrontation to start. Are you really sure, Daddy? There's no chance. Ava asked. No, sweetheart. It's over. She broke my trust and my heart. I can't accept that kind of betrayal. What if she felt like she had a reason to do it? Sweetheart, there is no reason to justify a long-term affair. If she got drunk, and it was a one-time thing, maybe. If she were assaulted, of course, that would be different. No, she chose this path. She betrayed my trust. Trust is the most important thing you can have with someone. You can't ever love someone you can't trust. I could never love someone who betrayed me like that. Our marriage is over. Ava looked out the window and saw two men approaching the car. What an idiot, Caroline Harlow said, looking out the window of her law office as Richard kissed her passionately. Glad for the one-way glass. I can't believe. Ugh. He thought he was going to get me first. Harder, baby. I want it all at the same time it's going down. Richard kissed her with intensity. Purely physical in every way. It took him six months to reel Caroline in, and he was grooming her to replace his wife, who had just gotten the final divorce decree ending their 14-year marriage. He got tired of his ex-wife's nagging about everything. He was tired of her weight gain. He was tired of her lack of interest in intimacy. He was embarrassed to be seen with her, and when their kids left for college, he broke free. Caroline was the same age as his wife, but she was more elegant. She had the fit body of a 34-year-old and was remarkably attractive. Richard was already upgrading her wardrobe, and she was going to make a great partner's wife. The knock on the window startled Jason. Are you Jason Harlow? Rolling down the window, he said, yes. You've been served. Please read the documents thoroughly. There is a restraining order requiring you to stay 100 yards from Caroline Harlow, Ava Harlow, and your marital residence. What? A restraining order from Ava. Ava grabbed the envelope from his hand and read the header for the dissolution of marriage. She found the restraining order and handed it to him. What the hell? He shouted. Oh my God. No, Ava said. Daddy, I swear I didn't know. What are you talking about? She handed him the other papers. In the documentation, it outlines several accusations, spousal abuse, child abuse, sexual misconduct. Avo, why? Daddy, I swear I had nothing to do with that. It's a lie or a mistake. Wait, how did she know I would be here right now? It's because I told her. His daughter's words broke his heart. When you told me she was cheating on you, I confronted her. She told me that she only did it because she had an investigator's report saying you were cheating on her. You can't be serious. Did you see the report? No, I did not. You believed her and didn't believe me. You let her set me up. Sweetheart, why? I love you so much. Why did you do this to me? I ask you not to say anything. I swear, Daddy, I didn't know about the restraining order. That abuse thing is. I swear I didn't say anything like that to anyone. He silently cried.
ignoring her pleas. Moments later, he said, You have to leave now, Ava. I can't be within one hundred yards of you anymore, he said softly. Daddy, no, she shouted. Go, or I could be arrested on top of all of this. The sheriff is still here watching me. Reading more, he said, Oh Jesus, they froze all of my accounts too. What am I going to do now? Congratulations to you both. You've destroyed me. I can't even afford to fight her law firm with all of these fake claims. I'll be fighting in court forever. Oh God, no. I'll fix this, Daddy, she said as she left the car and ran to the office building. Richard sighed in contentment after their encounter. That was great, babe, Caroline said. I just wish I had binoculars so I could see his face. Richard was just buckling his belt, and Caroline was smoothing her dress when a screaming Ava ran into the office. You? Child abuse. Sexual abuse. What is wrong with you? Ava screamed. I had to have the advantage, Caroline said. I had to strike first. Now he can't get into the house or have access to my money for a while. Now I have the upper hand on him. He didn't abuse me. I don't know that for sure. You two are really close, Caroline said with a smirk. Iva walked up to her and asked. He didn't cheat, did he? Of course not. Who would want him? She said with a laugh. You're a monster, Ava said as she clenched her fist to punch, but instead slapped her mother with all of her strength. Caroline went down to the ground in shock and pain. Richard laughed and said, Nice hit, kid. Ava froze, then looked around. She saw bookcases, shelves, and a messy desk. She smiled, looked at Richard, and swept everything off his desk. You'd better never cross my path again. I can and will do worse, she said, and walked out. Ava, wait. Damn it, Caroline screamed. Richard said, that little brat is going to pay for this. As she walked out, she passed a man with an envelope in his hand who asked her, Are you Caroline Harlow? In there, she said, and stormed off. Both Caroline and Richard laughed at her being served Jason's petition for divorce. Ava tried desperately to talk to her father out of fear. He knew he couldn't talk to her, so he didn't answer and cried every time he saw her call. He was afraid Caroline would find out and send the police after him for violating the restraining order. Caroline had already alienated him from all their friends, and only his parents and brother believed his innocence. His sister-in-law wouldn't let him near his niece and nephew, just in case it was true. That almost ended her marriage to his brother before George had to tell her the truth. He couldn't figure out what he did to earn that much hatred from Caroline and his daughter's betrayal. Even if she didn't know about the abuse allegation, she still told her mother that he knew about her affair and when she would be served. She even lied and said she wanted to be with him to support him when he had Caroline served, but she knew he was being served and said nothing. Ava tried to find someone to help her daddy. She found her mother's copy of the divorce papers and saw that the attorney worked at her mom's office, so going to him was out. She called Grandpa George. George was Jason's father, and she hoped he could help. What do you want, young lady, he said. Grandpa, we have to help Daddy. I don't know who to go to to get him help. He isn't taking my calls. I can't believe what you did to your dad, Ava. What were you thinking by helping your mother? Grandpa, it's all lies. I didn't do anything. It's all my mom and her lawyer boyfriend. Watch your mouth, girl. Sorry, Grandpa. I swear I, I didn't accuse him of any of that. And I had no idea that when I confronted her, she would go nuclear like this. All right, I'll see what I can do, but you better hope I can fix this. Is he there? Can I talk to him? He can't have any contact with you until that order is lifted. Every time you call him, he breaks down crying because of what's happened. He's afraid your mother will find out he spoke to you and turn him into the police. His lawyer said that there's a court date set up to have a hearing on it coming up but nothing can be done until then. Ava, crying herself, said, Grandpa, tell him I love him and miss him. If I see him, I will. Ava hung up and cried for several minutes, 
When she was finally composed, she went into her mother's room and started taking her lingerie from the drawers and her newest clothes from the closet and threw them down the stairs. She picked up the big pile, carried it out the front door, and threw it into the middle of the lawn. She laughed when she saw that some of the outfits were so new they had their tags still on them. Screw you, mother, she said out loud, and went to the shed to get the lighter fluid. She doused the clothes with the entire can, and used the aim and flame to light it. She noticed that the time was close to when her mother would be home. Ava smiled as she got an idea. As she pulled into the driveway, Caroline saw Ava sitting on a lawn chair in the front yard, roasting a marshmallow over a pile of her burning clothes. She screamed and ran out of the car, yelling at Ava. What the hell are you doing? Have you lost your mind? No, mother, I'm perfectly sane. I've decided to make you pay for my daddy not being able to talk to me. Every day that goes by until I speak to him, I'm going to destroy more of your stuff. You'd better drop that abuse claim as fast as possible, or more of your things will go up in flames. Ava, there's a court date on Monday. It will not be renewed. It was only for a short time. Don't care, mother. Until I talk to him, your stuff goes up in smoke. Caroline screamed as she went into the house. She called Jason, but of course, he didn't answer, and he deleted the message without listening to it. Moments later, a fire truck and a police car pulled up. One of the neighbors reported the fire. The policeman and one of the firemen walked up to Ava. What's all this about, young lady? The officer asked. My mom wanted to get rid of some clothes that she grew out of. She told me to do a bonfire with them, Ava said. You can't have a bonfire in the front yard. Is she home? He asked. Yes, sir. I'll put it out with the hose if you want. The fireman spoke up and asked, Did you use anything to light it, or did you just light the clothes? A whole can of charcoal lighter fluid, she said. No, no water. We'll use some sand to put it out, the fireman said. While the firemen dealt with the fire, the police officer rang the doorbell. Caroline opened the door, ready to lash out, but realized it was the police. Great. Well, put the fire out. It's no big deal, officer, Caroline said before he could speak. Firemen are doing that now, ma'am. You know it's against city ordinance to have an uncontrolled bonfire in your front yard. No, I didn't know, she said through gritted teeth. Here's your ticket. It's just a fine, no court appearance required. Next time, ma'am, just give them to Goodwill or Street Vincent de Paul. Less fortunate folks could use that stuff. She screamed and closed the door. Caroline's lawyer appeared before the judge at the hearing for the restraining order the next Monday. He didn't fight the appeal of it knowing it was falsely obtained. It served its purpose, bought time, and ruined Jason's reputation. Jason's lawyer made a motion to file a perjury charge against Caroline. The judge said without definitive proof that the order was filed under false pretenses, there'd be no perjury. You can open that can of worms in your countersuit in the divorce case, but you know it's grasping at straws. The fact that the restraining order was dropped provided little solace to Jason, who was in a horrible state of depression. His life was falling apart because he couldn't handle the false accusations, frozen assets, cheating wife, and what he felt was the worst part of it all. His daughter's betrayal. He was barely getting by mentally. He took time off work, drank too much, and was miserable to be around. He went to his house during the day when he knew Caroline and his daughter wouldn't be there. He found that she changed the locks, but he tried his garage door opener and it worked. Inside the garage, he found all of his belongings. There were several boxes, and his clothes were in trash bags. He noticed that she left him the wedding album and all of the pictures of the happy family that used to be spread around the house. He took those out, piled them in front of the door connected to the house, and urinated on them. He kept in contact with his parents and his brother, but relationships were being strained due to his problems. His parents begged him to see a psychiatrist, but he refused. He felt he didn't need a counselor to tell him that his life was falling apart and there was nothing he could do about it. Caroline's law firm fought a relentless battle with no mercy. 
She even told his employer about the restraining order and the accusations of abuse, and Jason was fired for cause. His contract had a morals clause. If he were in a better state of mind, he would have known that he could fight it and likely win, but he was just going through the motions at that point. No one knew where Jason was living. His only contact with his family was by phone, a court appearance related to the divorce, and he refused to speak to anyone except his attorney and the judge. Ava tried to speak to him on those occasions and cried every time he walked past her without looking at her. She thought that he looked like a dead man walking. Caroline was pleased with how everything was progressing. She had started resenting Jason months before, as Richard had turned her against him and had built up over the course of his seduction an almost hatred in her for Jason. After months of legal wrangling, the divorce was declared final. Jason got his share of his assets back. His attorney was able to force the sale of the house, and he kept his truck. He couldn't find a job because the false rumors about him abusing his daughter had spread around town. No one cared that he wasn't charged with anything. He decided to move to Miami, where he found work in his field as a sales manager. He put his life's belongings into the back of his pickup truck and was saying goodbye to his parents when Ava drove up. Daddy, I'm so sorry. None of this should have happened, she said as she ran up to hug him. He cried and did not return her hug. You chose your mother over me with no proof. You going to her caused the first domino to fall. I had to have the element of surprise because of that law firm she worked for. I had to be able to file first, so she couldn't retaliate. You can see now why. Daddy, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'm leaving. Now that false child abuse accusation just isn't going away. Once you're accused of something like that, it's a stigma you just can't wash off. Someday your mother and her lover will pay. Goodbye, Ava. I love you more than my own life. I did everything I could to give you a good life. I only hope you haven't grown up to be like your mother. She broke down in sobs as her grandmother hugged her. That gave him the opportunity to get in the truck and drive away. Caroline, will you marry me? Richard asked on the day the divorce was final. Yes, Richard. Oh, yes. She cried and jumped up to hug him, making a small scene in the restaurant. Let's go to your place and celebrate, she said as he paid the check. She loved his big house and couldn't wait to move in and redecorate. Getting rid of the tacky furniture and drapes his ex-wife picked out was a must, but their bedroom set was going to be the first thing to go. Richard snickered as they walked out when he saw his ex-wife having dinner with her parents. His ex-wife... Linda was disgusted with him and his latest conquest. She spat at him as they walked by, and he didn't even care to notice. Jason walked into the truck depot and saw Sweet Lou standing at the door. Jason, what's the matter, man? You look like someone spilled milk on your cereal. Divorce is final today, ha. Huh? Well, after what that witch did to you, you should be celebrating today. It's not her. It's my kid. She took the witch's side, and I just can't get over it. She calls me and emails me, but I just can't bring myself to talk with her. Maybe I should see a counselor. Maybe you should meet someone new, came a voice from behind them. Hey, Marianne, that's not a bad idea, Lou said. Ah, uh, who'd want my old broken heart, Jason said. Marianne leaned in and whispered, me, big guy, and flicked his earlobe with her tongue. She walked away, and the men shook their heads, watching her walk off. Go for it, Jason. She's a great gal. What the heck? Why not? Jason answered. That's my boy. Now let's get on the road. For their first date, Jason took Marianne to dinner and a movie. After the movie, they went to a diner for coffee and pie. Jason, you need to keep your chin up. Man, you're a good guy that got a raw deal. It'll work out in the end, she said. Maybe, Marianne. For a long time, I couldn't figure out what I did wrong. I didn't understand why she went so hard at me during the divorce. She called me a child abuser and a molester for crying out loud. Jason, that witch is in your past. Shake it off. And it's all behind you now, she said, grabbing his hand. Look ahead, not back. 
I'll make it worth your while. He smiled and squeezed her hand. Let's get out of here. Marianne pulled Jason for a kiss as she opened her front door. Want to see my etchings, big guy? I would love to. She held his hand and took him to her bedroom. The moonlight was shining through the window, giving the room a comforting bluish glow. They kissed with tongues intertwined and undressed each other slowly. There was nothing rushed. They were going to savor every moment. They had a passionate night together. And as they caught their breath, she said, Your ex is a fool. She wanted your money, not your love. Well, her loss is my gain, and I'm going to take full advantage. He kissed her and said, Anytime, sweetheart. Anytime. A week to the day later, a figure dressed in all black crept up to the back door of a Facebook photo of their target sitting at his desk. The arrogant man had it as his cover photo. The closet was located behind and to the right of the desk, and the room was dimly lit with only the desk lamp on. The closet door was slatted, but they could still see into the room well enough. They opened the door, hid behind the desk, and waited. The only concern was if their target went to the closet before sitting at the desk. That would make it messy, but the job would still get done. Their perfect alibi would ensure their safety either way. Richard Green walked into his home office and looked at his computer monitor, which was at an angle on the desk. His back was completely turned to the closet behind him. The intruder slowly opened the closet door and slinked out carefully. Richard heard a noise and looked up. The gun was put to his temple, and the trigger was pulled. The gun was placed in his hand. A note was left on the desk, and the shooter quickly walked out the door. The price is paid in full, was all the note said. Caroline had arrived home from shopping and walked into the door to Richard's office to show him the new bedding she had bought. She screamed when she saw the body slumped in the chair and blood dripping to the floor. She pulled her cell phone out of her purse, called 911, and reported the shooting. She looked at him and saw the gun in his hand and the note on the desk. She didn't touch it but read what it said and got the message. No, Jason, no, she cried. What have you done? Detective Marcus Jordan got the call and headed over to the green home. As he arrived, he saw a crying woman in the living room and the crime scene techs walking in and out of the office. He surveyed the scene and looked at a new set of golf clubs in the corner of the room. Nice set, he thought, and continued looking around. He looked at the body and saw the gun still clutched in the victim's right hand. He asked one of the officers who arrived first, What do we have so far? Apparent self-inflicted gunshot. Victim is attorney Richard Green, the homeowner. Fiance is Caroline Harlow. She found the body and made the call to 911. Is there a note? Yes, sir. It's typed and not signed. It only has one sentence. Here you go. He handed him a plastic bag with the note. Detective Jordan frowned and said, is the fiancé the brunette in there? Yes, sir. Ma'am, do you have any idea what the note means? Detective Jordan asked Caroline. Yes, it means it wasn't suicide. My ex-husband killed him. Richard hated guns. He didn't own one. Why do you think your ex did this? Because he felt Richard took me from him. Did he? Were you seeing the deceased while you were married? Looking down, embarrassed, she said, for a short time, yes. Could there be anyone else who may have wanted him dead? He was an attorney, right? I guess. His ex-wife was pretty angry about being dumped. He did corporate law, civil cases that hardly ever saw a courtroom. Okay, mom. Where were you tonight? Shopping. You don't think I did it. I don't even know that it wasn't a suicide yet. Could you get your receipts for me, please? Okay, detective. Jason Harlow was visited by Detective Jordan on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Mr. Harlow, I am Detective Jordan. I need to ask you a few questions, please. Sure, Detective. What's up? Where were you last night at around 7 o'clock p.m.? Working. I was driving the rig through Rockford. I pulled into the depot at 8.30. You can check the logs. 
Where were you coming in from? Madison. What happened? Richard Green was shot last night in an apparent suicide. Apparent. Let's just say there are some inconsistencies. Okay, well, I couldn't have suicided him from Rockford. No, sir. If I have any more questions, I'd like to call if that's okay. Sure, I'll give you my new cell number. The detective left and wasn't happy that he had to drive to northwestern Chicago to talk to Jason and then to the other side of town to the truck depot to verify the alibi. He thought some more about what was bothering him about the suicide. Why would a left-handed man shoot himself with his right hand? Why did he type the note? Why was the gunshot residue on his hand such a small amount? It was present and would hold up that the victim fired the gun. But it was odd. After the detective left, Jason sat at his kitchen table where he was talking with Sweet Lou. What was that all about, Jason? Jason laughed and said, Would you believe my ex's fiancé took his own life? No, that is unbelievable. Yep, I hope my alibi checks out. They laughed and clinked their beer bottles together in a toast. Caroline was sitting in the front row of the funeral, crying over the man who stole her away from her wonderful husband so easily. Tears were being shed over the man who convinced her to go nuclear and ruin a good man so she could trade up. She had been madly in love with her sales manager husband up until she was transferred to work for Richard. Richard targeted her and began to wear her down almost immediately with snide comments about sales managers and flippant comments about him when he was out of town. It was too easy for Richard. He planted the seed that she was neglected by Jason's long days and sometimes overnight runs, and it grew. She couldn't decide if she was crying for the loss of her fiancé or the loss of her husband and the death of her relationship with her daughter. It was all a waste. She didn't hear, nor would she have cared about the room buzzing about her. She didn't see the glare she was getting from Richard's ex and his daughters. They blamed her for his death. You could have come to the funeral and paid your respects. Caroline said, walking up to her daughter, who was home for the weekend from college. Ova glared at her and said, How dare you tell me that I'm supposed to pay respect to a man who destroyed my father? Forget you, mother. I shouldn't even have referred to that piece of trash as a man. He's less than dirt on my shoe. She slammed the door as she walked out of the house and drove the long drive back to school in Madison, Wisconsin. Detective Jordan sat in a meeting with his commander, going over the lack of progress in the case. All of the suspects alibis check out. Jason Harlow's truck tracker shows he made no stops on his way from Madison to Chicago, and the trip time was correct. The warehouse crew identified him as the driver. Caroline Harlow's receipts and the surveillance cameras place her at Macy's, Victoria's Secret, and Starbucks within the medical examiner's window for the time of death. Green's ex and her daughters were having dinner with her parents and her brother and sister-in-law for her birthday, Jordan said. It was the ex's birthday. His commander asked. No, they were just celebrating it. Hell, I even checked out Harlow's daughter and she was at school over three hours away in Wisconsin. No chance it was suicide, his commander asked. It's possible. It just doesn't feel right. Well, with no suspects, no motive, and no concrete evidence that it was even a murder, close it as a suicide. Jordan nodded and left the room frustrated. Six months later, Caroline had Marcus Davis over for dinner. That was their third date, and Caroline took him to bed. After a night of passion, Marcus went home. He cracked a beer before going to bed and sat down to check his email. As he sat at the kitchen table, the gun was put to his head and fired. The gun was placed in his hand, and a note was left. The price is paid in full, it said. Detective Jordan walked through the apartment to the kitchen. Before he could speak, the suicide note was handed to him. Well, damn, looks like I was right about the other one. Now I just have to figure out who the heck did it, he said to the officer. Any fingerprints, Mark? He asked the technician. Yeah, but if I had to guess right now, I'd say they are the victims. Any witnesses? Who called it in? Jordan asked. Neighbor heard the shot and called 911. 
No one saw anyone come or go. Of course not. How'd they get in? No busted locks or windows. It looks like the balcony to me. The sliding door wasn't locked. The victim probably didn't worry about it with him being on the second floor. It wouldn't be too difficult to climb up, though. I'd say anyone of reasonably average height could jump and reach the bottom and pull themselves up. Average height for male or female. Average male. Tall woman. Where's the guy's phone? Jordan asked. Bagged over here. Jordan used his gloved hands to look for his last call. Just had to check. The last call was made to an Angela. I will be shocked if she isn't Angela Harlow. After going through the usual condolences and pleasantries, the detective got to work. Miss Harlow, why do your lovers seem eager to hurt themselves? Detective Jordan asked. It's got to be Jason. This is him punishing me. Where were you last night, Mom? Home all night. I have an alarm system that will verify that. Tell me about the alarm system. When it's set, it picks up doors and windows opening. I set it when Marcus left last night and turned it off this morning when you came by. She said through tears. Did you turn it off at any time last night? No, since Avid is at school, so it would have been uninterrupted all night. That's easy enough to check on. So your theory is that your husband is behind these deaths that aren't? Yes. Who else could it be? When was the last time you spoke to your husband? Before the divorce. Have you seen him following you, or has he contacted you? No, he has never called me. How would he know your most recent lover then? I don't know, but it has to be him. Okay, that's all I have for now. Please stay close by, he said, turning to leave. Oh, one more thing. How tall are you? Five nine or so. Five ten. Why? Just curious. Sorry again for your loss. Same memo. The commander said back at the police station. Yes, sir, Detective Jordan said. Keep me updated daily on your progress. This is too coincidental. I've heard of a body to die for, but never a body that makes you want to hurt yourself. The girlfriend's alibi is solid. I'll see if I can break it, but we'll see. I'm on my way to her ex now, the detective said wryly. Off you go then. Let me know what you get. Right as Detective Jordan walked away, he had a bad feeling that all of the prime suspect's alibis would be as airtight as last time. Jason and Marianne were snuggling on his couch, binge-watching Jack Ryan on Prime when the doorbell rang. Detective Jordan, what can I do for you today? Jason asked, motioning him in. Sir, where were you last night at 1 o'clock a.m.? On the road, on the way back from Detroit. I pulled in at 2.30. What happened now? Do you know Marcus Davis? Don't think so. He was seen your ex-wife. He seemingly shot himself last night. No. Maybe she's a black widow or something. Maybe. Thank you. If I need anything else, I'll be in touch. Jason laughed as he closed the door. What was that all about, baby? Marianne asked. Looks like another of my ex-wife's boyfriends passed away. Oh my God, she gasped as she brought her hand to her mouth. Yep, thank God, I have an alibi. I hope whoever is responsible keeps picking times when I'm on the road. Jason's cell phone rang. He looked and saw it was Ava, so he ignored it. Marianne frowned and said, There's never going to be a chance for her. Don't see how. She misses you. She reached out to me, and we've spoken. What? He shouted as he stood up. Relax, honey, she said, pulling him back down. I'm not going to interfere. It's your decision, and you have to live with it. She is still your Facebook friend. She saw when I tagged you at the sushi joint I made you try last month. She stalks your Facebook just like you stalk hers. She instant messaged me just to see how you were and to say that she was happy that you found someone you're happy with. She told me she will never stop trying to talk with you. She calls me once a week or so just to chat. She likes to hear where you've gone and where you're going. She was fascinated that I schedule your runs and have control over your schedule. She said that I can always make sure to have you home when I need you home, and that would help our relationship, 
unlike with your ex. She always wanted to know what cities I saw. We would talk for hours about the places, people, and things I saw on the road ever since she was little. When she was a child, I had a lot of overnight runs that got me back early. I'd make her breakfast, we'd eat, and I'd tell her about my trip. He sighed at the fond memories. Marianne, I love you, but please stay out of it. She hugged him and said, I'm not in it. I'll never push you into anything. It's all up to you. I flat out told her that I would not put you two together. He nodded, pulled her in tight, and unpaused the show. I just don't have anything that puts her at the scene, boss. There is no evidence that anyone was at either scene actually. No forced entry, no fingerprints or footprints, and no inconsistencies in the splatter pattern. If it wasn't for the identical notes, I'd close them both as suicides, Detective Jordan told his commander. The ex's alibi is airtight. As a nuclear reactor, have you considered Green's ex as some sort of revenge thing? Yep. She was at a club on security cameras with her new boyfriend, and her kids are away at school. Two years later, Caroline broke her pattern and started dating Lance Walker. She had promised herself that she wouldn't risk anyone's life by dating them more than once after the suicides. She hadn't been celibate, though she had relegated herself to one-night stands with bar pickups. An STD changed her mind on that, so she needed to take a chance and settle down. After a month of dating Lance, she got comfortable. Some would say sloppy. She stopped trying to hide the relationship and was dating him in public. Lance was watching a ball game at home when the gun was put to his temple and the trigger was pulled. The gun was put in his hand and the same note was left. Once again, the price is paid in full. This is Jordan, he said, answering the call on his cell. Hi, detective. It's Detective Stan Hansen with Schaumburg. What can I do for you, man? You have a cold case that I may have a tie into. Which one? The paid in full suicides. I've got one. No any ties to Caroline Harlow. Yes, she was his girlfriend. No way. The ex-husband's alibi it is airtight. Yep, dragging through Madison, Hansen answered. Where was she? At home, alone. The security system provided an alibi for her last time, and we couldn't break it. Is it the same thing this time? Chinese food delivery this time, she ordered from her home phone, and the food arrived thirty minutes later. The shot happened in that window, according to the neighbor who called 911. It's a twenty-three-minute drive each way from her house to the deceased's apartment, and it's a three-flight walk upstairs. It's close, but we don't see how she could have done it in that window. Agreed. Let's get together tomorrow and compare files. Again, all alibis were unbreakable, and there were no new suspects. The cases went unsolved. Jason and Marianne were sitting in the large auditorium watching Ava as she walked across the stage to receive her bachelor's degree. Jason beamed with pride and had to wipe a tear as it threatened to roll down his cheek. Marianne squeezed his hand tightly and kissed him. After the ceremony, they walked out to their car, and Marianne asked him, Honey, you love her so much. Please call her. No, she made her choice when she sided with her mother over me. She only came to regret it when she felt bad about what her mother did to me. I needed her on my side. I was in the right, but she didn't believe me and opened the door for her mother to take my life out from under me. Do you know that there are old friends of mine that still believe I hurt Ava and got away with it? Marian nodded. No, she made her choice, and we all have to live with it, he finished. Marianne frowned at his stubbornness, grabbed his hand, and said, Were you this hard-headed before your divorce? No, not even close. Five years later, Caroline and Ava were sitting in the front row of the funeral home's viewing room. It was a large turnout for Jason Harlow's wake and funeral procession. Jason succumbed to pancreatic cancer a few weeks after walking Ava down the aisle at her wedding. He had a few new friends and co-workers that showed, and his small family went, but he didn't rebuild a large network of friends after the divorce. Most of his old friends, neighbors, and co-workers came to pay respect to the good man they used to know 
and lost touch with over the years. His girlfriend, Marianne, was there. They never married. She tried very hard not to spit on Caroline for the pain she caused her man. His best friend Lou DeMarco regaled Ava with stories of her dad's last few years. He filled her heart with stories she would never have known. It was Marianne that finally convinced him to hear Ava out and make up with her when he was diagnosed as terminal. He'd spent years throwing away letters, deleting emails, and ignoring calls. Their reunion was perfectly timed, as he and Marianne knew they were his last months. Ava actually moved her wedding day up, costing her a fortune in fees and rush jobs, but she got her greatest wish. Her daddy gave her away. Their tearful reunion and walk down the aisle gave Jason a final peace of mind before he lost his last battle. The last words he spoke were thanking Marianne for giving him Ava back and apologizing for never marrying her. She understood and never pushed him for marriage. They were happy as they were. At the viewing, Marianne told Ava how he'd always missed her and regretted not getting in touch with her years before. Her mother asked about it. So Ava told her about some of their reconciliation. He told me that he was at my graduations in the back, away from anyone who would recognize him. That's true, Marianne confirmed. I was with him. He said that he followed my career as I moved up the ranks and made detective for Streamwood. He was so proud of you. He saved the clippings from the Herald. You were the youngest ever to make detective there. He loved it when they said you had a knack for criminology and later when the paper called you a savant of crime scenes, he almost cried. Marion said. He said it was because of all the Columbo and CSI you guys watched together when you were little. He hoped you'd make it to Chicago or some other big city and have bigger cases. Ava smiled for most of the wake, listening to stories of her dad's life after the divorce. She was happy to finally meet Marion, who she had still been speaking with on occasion. His new life seemed as good for him as it could have been. He died a happy man. She said a final prayer after the funeral, and thank God, he finally found peace. Caroline had been trying to reconnect with Ava throughout the wake and funeral. She blew it at the luncheon after the service when she made the wrong comment at the worst possible time. They were sitting alone after everyone had left when Caroline said, Ava, I have finally found peace. What are you talking about, mother? I haven't been able to have a relationship for these last few years in fear that your father would hurt them. Ava couldn't believe her ears. He was cleared by the police, you worthless fool. But now you're happy he's gone so you can date freely. You're as bad as you ever were. I had hoped you'd change. But now, I hope you live with this forever. Caroline winced. You don't understand. Ava cut her off and said, The next time I see you, Mother will be when we are lowering your body into the ground. No, Ava, please understand. Ava cut her off again, saying, Goodbye, Mother. Good luck with your love life. That was the last time she ever spoke to her mother. Ten months later, Caroline was having dinner with her boyfriend, Charlie Harlan, at an expensive steakhouse. These last eight months have been so wonderful for me, Charlie said, squeezing her hand. Me too, Charlie. I wasn't sure I would ever love again, but we found each other. Caroline, I love you. Will you marry me? Caroline took a deep breath and said, Yes, yes, I'll marry you. There was a pang of fear in her stomach. He smiled and exhaled in contentment. Later, the gun was placed to his temple, and the trigger was pulled. The gun was put into his hand, the cigar put into the ashtray and a note was left tucked under the heavy ash bin on the table. The price is paid in full. Caroline hung up the phone after talking with Detective Jordan, her face wet with tears after the emotional conversation. She went up to her bathroom and grabbed a bottle of sleeping pills. She hadn't needed one for a while, but always had them on hand. She walked out to her mailbox, placed an envelope in, and lifted the flag to let the mailman know there was outgoing mail. She lay on her bed and thought of her wedding to Jason, and what a perfect day it was. She thought of Ava and how proud she was of her career. She thought of family vacations and trips to the park. She regretted ever meeting Richard Green and ruining her own life. Finally, 
She said a prayer that she would see Jason soon. She placed the note on her chest as she fell asleep for the last time. Her note read, My price is paid in full. Ava walked in with the mail and a bag of groceries. She set everything down, put her keys on the hook, and kicked her shoes off. Her husband, Blake, wouldn't be home until almost midnight since he worked the second shift as a police officer, so she had the pleasure of a silent house to enjoy. She opened a bottle of California Roots Cabernet and poured a healthy glass. Taking a drink, she walked over to the pile of mail and saw a letter. Oh my God! She cried out when she read the sender's name, Caroline Harlow. She tore it open and read her mother's last communication to her. Falling into her chair, tears fell from her eyes as she read what her mother's suicide truly meant. Wow, mother wow, she said to the empty house. She picked up her cell phone and made a call. Detective Jordan, this is Ava Harlow Jason and Caroline Harlow's daughter. Hello, young lady. Sorry to hear about your mother's suicide. Thank you. At least hers saved you some investigating. Yes, Charlie Harlan. No, but hers. Yes. What can I do for you, Ava? I received a letter in the mail from my mother. It's a confession. What? He screamed into the phone. It's a confession for all of the suicides. Apparently, she was insane. I can't believe it. Jesus Christ. Okay. Come and meet me at my station as soon as you can. On my way. She took the first page and lit it on fire, put it in her fireplace, and made sure it burned completely. The letter read, My dearest Ava, I'm giving you this last gift of my penance. Whether you believe it or not, I love you with all of my heart, and I'm sorry for all of the pain that I caused you. It was not intentional, and hurting you and your father was the worst thing I've ever done. I knew it had to be you when Charlie was killed, and I accept my punishment. I'm sorry I caused you to punish me in this way, and I hope you can now live the rest of your life without the pain of my betrayal of you and your father. Destroy this page and give page two to the police. Page two is my confession for them. I take full responsibility and give you the gift of your freedom. It's all my fault, and I can't ever repair your lost years with your dad or the hurt I caused. So much death, and it has to stop. Maybe this will make it up to you, and you can finally forgive me and be at peace. Please tell my future grandchildren stories of the good times and not of how I destroy our lives. I pray that you and Blake have a long and happy marriage. Don't ever fall for it when someone tries to take you from him. I love you with all of my heart. Mom. P.S. Please see someone and get yourself the help that you desperately need. On the second page, dearest Ava, by the time you get this, I will already be dead by my own hand. I can't take the guilt any longer. I killed all of those men, my lovers. They all had to pay the price of taking me from your father. I was always his. Maybe now I can join him again. May God forgive me. I will always love you, and I'm sorry I ruined our lives. Until Richard, we truly had a perfect family. Mom. Ava was escorted to Detective Jordan's desk and sat down after exchanging greetings. After he read the letter, he said, Jesus, Ava, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just can't believe it. She must have really lost it years ago, when I stopped talking to her after what she did to my dad. I can't believe she kept dating just to kill them. God, I just don't get it. It kind of makes sense that it was her for a couple of the murders. Her alibi wasn't great. We just couldn't place her at the scene. And frankly, we didn't have a good enough case. I always felt it was your father or Green's ex-wife, but we couldn't break their alibis either. Well, I'm glad it's all over. The murders, her pain, everything. Take care, detective. You too. Ava walked out of the police station with a mile-wide smile and shook her head. She stopped as she opened her car door, looked up to the sky, and said, Thanks, Mom. I hope you do find Daddy wherever you are. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.